been hearing for a while now about how bad it is for the environment when we burn coal to make electricity. But it has been happening here in the Northwest. In fact, it's been going on for decades. But now we're at the edge of a turning point, an historic turning point. Relatively soon, the coal plants across the region will shut down. Their dependable but dirty supply of electricity will stop, replaced by much less dependable but clean renewable sources. Which does sound good, but then it made me wonder, will there be enough electricity when coal goes away? I've spent the last couple of months traveling hundreds of miles looking for that answer, from wind farms and natural gas plants to big industry meetings and more. Now, I wanna take you on the journey, and it's time to pay attention because the stakes are high. Drive east out of Portland along the Columbia Gorge, and it won't take long until you spot the massive windmills. They're called wind turbines now. They rise 300 feet above the rolling fields of central Washington and Oregon. Their huge arms swing in a cadence that feels like a drumbeat against climate change. It's part of the song of renewables sung around the world. Wind power is growing as the calls for addressing climate change get louder. Whose planet? Our planet! Whose planet? Our planet! The planet is under attack! Set off sight EPA, do your job! Utility CEOs in the Northwest have embraced renewables, partly motivated by the public outrage. I would say the era of coal in the energy sector is coming to an end. It is by far the worst offender when it comes to carbon generation in the electric sector. The era of coal is on its way out, for sure. The governors of Washington and Oregon support the move away from coal. Washington Governor Jay Inslee even ran for president on a platform built on addressing climate change. The future is not in coal, and we have moved past it. We're past coal. Yes, and we're moving forward uh, towards a uh, non-carbonized economy. Environmental advocates began the push to kill coal in the West a decade ago and say it's critically important to finish the job now. You support getting rid of these coal plants? Absolutely support the closure of the coal plants on a schedule and with a plan that maintains the reliability of the system. That future reliability is something you should care about very much. If the electric system is reliable, the lights go on every time you hit the switch. But if it's not reliable, sometimes you get no power. Coal may be dirty, but it is reliable. It works when you need it every time. But over the next eight years, 12 coal plants across the West will shut down. They range from Centralia, Washington, to southeastern Montana, north-central Nevada, to Wyoming, and Boardman, Oregon. Combined, they generate a huge amount of electricity, 4,800 megawatts. That's enough power to turn on the lights for 3.8 million homes. Getting rid of all the coal plants is a huge deal. It'll be awesome for the environment. But will there be enough electricity? That's kind of a tricky question. In fact, there's about 400 industry leaders from the Northwest that are gathered here right now trying to figure out when coal goes away, what do they replace it with, and will there be enough power? So I'm going to find some of those folks and see what they're thinking. As the former head of Bonneville Power Administration, Steve Wright probably knows more about electricity and the Northwest power system than anyone else. So when he sounded concerned, it caught my attention. Headed towards zero uh, over the course of certainly the next five to ten years. And when that goes to zero, will there be enough power to replace it? Well, I think that's what this conference is about, is that our forecasts say that we're going to have significant problems. Stay with me now. This part's going to get a little bit technical. Part of the concern comes from thousands of computer simulations run by an organization called the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. Part of their job is to look out into the future and predict whether we'll run out of electricity during a worst case scenario. Remember, the coal plant retirements take that enormous amount of dependable electricity out of the system. That significantly raises the danger that there will not always be enough power. Here are the numbers they found. On the conservative side, their simulation found a 26% chance we could run out in the year 2026. A more aggressive simulation found a 33% chance we run out in the year 2024. Either way, both are shockingly high numbers that should grab your attention. 
with that 30% probability, one out of three times when these scenarios are run, it runs into trouble? Yes. Is that what that means? Yes. And that is pretty much unprecedented. And that's only six years from now. Yeah, it's coming up pretty fast. And in our world, when it takes a long time to build generating resources, to put in place demand response programs, to build transmission, yeah, we are quite concerned about whether we have enough time to be able to address this issue. To make up for the lost power from coal, the big utility companies are building new wind farms and solar plants, or contracting to buy power from outside sources, along with experimenting with ways to change the way that we use electricity, trying to lower demand. If a utility really runs into trouble, many plan to simply buy excess electricity from other power generators on the open market. But that plan has one big flaw. If everyone does the same thing at the same time, it could wipe out the supply. It's sort of like a lot of homeowners and an approaching storm. Everyone goes to the same few stores to buy generators, but pretty soon the stores are empty and some folks get left in the dark. It could result in skyrocketing prices for electricity or something the Northwest has not experienced in modern time, rolling blackouts. You with me so far? The coal plants are going away and the experts worry that in five or six years there'll be a gap between the demand for electricity and the supply that's available. And if there's a sudden emergency, it seems that most of the big utility companies all have the same emergency plan, which means it may not work for everybody. It's something that everyone fears. Coming up, avoiding the mistakes of the past. Some of the same people trying to plan for the future have lived through a power crisis before. Now, the lessons they've learned could prove invaluable as they try to keep the lights on for all of us. To avoid the mistakes of the past, utility companies would be smart to listen to Steve Wright. That's because he's already lived through a power crisis. The uh, sense of, oh my gosh, I feel like I've seen this play before. In 2001, an historic drought limited the amount of electricity the dams could produce. The Northwest did not have enough power to meet demand. Now, it's been a long time. And I worry that people have forgotten about that or moved on and done other things. But Wright remembers. You know, it's been close to 20 years since then. I got to tell you, Mr. Wright, you're wrong. But I was in charge of the Bonneville Power Administration at that point, And I was confronted with extraordinarily difficult and even moral challenges, I would say. BPA wants aluminum smelters to shut for up to two years. How are they going to do something in two years? It won't open up again. To avoid rolling blackouts, Wright's emergency plan was to buy back power the BPA had already sold to the aluminum smelters, then cut them off for two years. Wright faced their wrath. It is not my goal. It is not the goal of this agency to put the aluminum industry out of business in this region. But that is exactly what happened. We basically put 5,000 aluminum workers out of work. We shut down the aluminum industry because we didn't have enough power to be able to serve them. It was the most scarring event of my career and even of my life, I would say, to go through that period, to be in a position of uh, having to make those choices. Remember that forecast, the chance the lights will not turn on? Well, it's worse now for the year 2026 at 26% than it was shortly after that crisis in the year 2003 at 24%. So it's not like that perfect storm is make-believe. It really did happen. It happened here in 2001, and that was back when we still had all the coal plants. It was brutal. It was a little crazy. Joe Horner was in the middle of it, too. Back then, he was an energy manager for one of the aluminum companies. It was, you know, something that I wouldn't want to live through again. Horner now works for Pacific Corps as a senior vice president. He watches over the power grid. He'll do everything he can to make sure there is enough power when the coal plants go away. He's one of many who worry about that forecast that we could run out of electricity at times in the future. 
It makes me very nervous. It's very significant compared to where we've been historically, you know, down in the, in the single digits for, for the most part. So I think it, it would make any utility operator very nervous to have that staring at them and, and knowing that that's a real possibility in the future. The possibility raised its ugly little head this last spring. Over four days in March, a number of factors, including extra cold weather and low natural gas supplies, sent a shockwave through the West Coast energy system. In March, we saw prices that normally might be in the $40 per megawatt hour skyrocket to over $900 a megawatt hour. Wow. That was alarming to us, but it's an early indication that we have to pay attention to the balance between source and supply. Still to come, as coal power plants go away, what replaces them? Wind turbines are a big part of that answer, but they have some major drawbacks. If a future without coal means more electricity from renewable sources, I wanted to see those renewables up close and learn how much electricity they can really make. I went to a place called the Leaning Juniper Wind Farm. It's a Pacific power plant near Arlington, Oregon. It has 67 state-of-the-art wind turbines, which put out a combined 100 megawatts of electricity when the conditions are right. That's enough to power 80,000 homes each moment it's producing electricity. I got to climb inside to the very top. The compartment is cramped, as you might expect. The room mostly holds a big generator. When the turbine blades spin, the generator makes electricity. There's also a small door that opens to the outside. So now we're up at the top of the windmill, the wind turbine, I guess we're supposed to call it. I don't know if you can hear anything that I'm saying, but it's quite a view up here, and the wind is definitely blowing. But there is one big challenge with wind. It does not always blow, even though it did blast hard enough on this day to force us into the shelter of the car for an interview. Yes. Which is great for us because that means it's a great day to make uh, renewable energy with wind. The reality is wind farms, while renewable and sustainable, are not all that reliable. Pacific Corps' Tim Hemstreet told me they only make power about 30% of the time. On average, a project like this operates about a third of the time, okay. producing full power. So the 100 megawatts is only 100 megawatts some of the time. And the electricity here must be used when it's produced. It cannot be stored, although in the future batteries may change that. Critics have also pointed out the turbines create dangerous obstacles for birds and bats. Another renewable is solar. But I learned solar farms in Oregon make up less than 1% of the electricity generated. So even though it's still a small piece of the mix, it's growing pretty quickly. This one is owned by PGE. Its 7,000 panels make about 1.5 megawatts of power. That's enough for about 1,200 homes. Solar is still a small part of the answer for now. The West also leans heavily on dams in the Columbia and other rivers. Hydropower can make up as much as 60% of our electricity. But dams have their own reliability issues. Remember the crisis in 2001 that hurt the aluminum industry? Well, that was largely driven by an historic drought. In low water years, dams are not able to generate as much power. Which brings us to natural gas. Not a renewable, and about half as dirty as coal, but very reliable. I visited this big PGE plant near Klatskanai. It's called Port Westward 1 and 2 and can make as much as 649 megawatts. That's enough for about a half million homes. They make electricity by burning natural gas sent into it through an underground pipe that comes from Canada. It's loud here. Burning the gas boils water into steam, which spins a huge turbine to make electricity. From the outside, it sort of looks like a massive jet engine. Natural gas plants are called dispatchable in the industry it means they can be quickly turned on or off when needed. That's a crucial difference from the renewables that depend on Mother Nature. All right, and even though you're making it more efficient, it's still putting out, I think it was a million tons, the two plants combined of that carbon is, dioxide. That's correct. There's always going to be emissions from uh, when you're combusting some source of energy. But here's something I did not see coming. Plant manager Mark White believes he's as much an environmentalist as anyone working at a coal plant or a gas plant and people, you know, say, okay, you can't be an environmentalist if you work at a plant. Actually, I am. I can 
I can do more in a day by making this plant more efficient, operating efficiently than I could any day in, in driving an electric car. Gas plants like this are extremely reliable. They hit the switch, the power comes on, but they do still pollute about a million tons of carbon dioxide a year from these two plants. So when you hear government leaders saying we're going to a zero carbon future, it would not include a plant like this. In a future where there are no coal plants, no gas fired plants, there is no dependable power. And that is a real problem. I took the issue to Arnie Olson, He's not part of any utility company, but his firm studies electricity supplies to help give the utilities an objective look at what's really possible. You've got the coal plants going down, you've got local governments restricting natural gas plants, and electricity needs going up all at the same time, and how do you make that gap? It's a real challenge that I think utilities are facing all over the country. His company, E3, looked for the same answer that we're after. Will there be enough power in the Northwest when coal goes away? The answer, it's unclear. Yeah, especially you know, utilities in the most forward-looking jurisdictions with the most forward-looking executives and boards are grappling with this exact challenge and they don't have a good answer today uh, other than we need to continue to build natural gas-fired power plants. Uh, to make sure that we can keep the lights on during those multi-day periods of low wind and solar production and, and high demands. Right now, there are no new gas-fired power plants in the permitting phase in Washington state and only one in Oregon, and its construction date keeps getting pushed back. One hopeful force is the speed at which new technologies are being invented to help renewables. Commercial batteries, for example, can only store about six hours worth of power now but that seems sure to improve. You know, we're seeing technology change almost overnight. You know, battery storage, uh, all the different types of things that we're doing on our system. You know, in five years from now, I, I personally feel that a lot of that is, is gonna be outdated and, and we'll, we'll see new technology. The energy makeup of the West is changing fast. There's no doubt about that. Coal is going away and it's unlikely anything will stop it. It is what most customers want. But the shift away from coal to a bigger reliance on renewables brings significant risks. Do I think that people understand the potential consequences of this right now? Generally, no. Am I surprised at that? No. Uh, do I hope that we can be able to get people's attention? Yes, I do. Because it's big. Because it's big, right. There's a lot at stake here. And it's, it's not just about money, and it's not just about whether the lights go out for an hour or two or something like that. It's much more significant than that. The human consequences here are, uh, are as big as you can get. Which brings us back to our fundamental question. Will there be enough electricity? Well, after all of our research and all of our work, all I can tell you is nobody knows for sure. But this is certain. You are going to feel the impacts of this change, and you're especially going to notice it if we run out.